All right, okay. Well, let's start. So this is the last part of the course. Um, as you may have seen in Slack, I've said that just a few more classes are remaining and some of them are guest lectures. So we have two guest lectures, Bamda Dhaseini and Hugo Lavana. And we also have a seminar coming up by Giuseppe Savari on November 30th, okay? Okay, so let's start with again. So this week, our plan is to do go back to entropic regularization. We are kind of going back and forth into this topic. And um, parallelly, we want to tie down its relationship with the Mange Ampere and the parabolic Mange Ampere. PDs. So let's start with entropic regularization. So today we'll talk about so back to entropic regularization. And if you re if you recall the idea of entropic regularization, this is in continuum. I think Yanwen mostly covered this the discrete case. The the continuum case is called the Schrodinger bridge problem, as I have explained several lectures ago. So I'm given an epsilon positive. So I'm trying to let people in the class. So I'm given an epsilon positive. I'm given, let's say, two densities, rho naught and rho one on RD. And then I'm looking into this following problem, infimum of gamma in the set of couplings of rho naught and rho one. And then I have two things here. I have one half integral of norm of y minus x norm squared d gamma. And the other is epsilon times entropy of gamma. And sometimes this thing is called an EOT cost for entropy, entropy optima, optimized, I don't know what EOT, entropic, entropic reg optimized cost, but it's called EOT cost. Oh, EOT is just entropy regularized optimal transport. So EOT, epsilon, and rho naught and rho one. Now correct me if I'm wrong. I think Young would mostly covered the case when this is discrete uh, measures. But as I have mentioned during the Schrodinger Bridge lecture, that this is also defined in continuum measures. So um, how is this entropy defined? This is in continuum, so the entropy is defined as the integral of gamma xy log of gamma xy dx dy. And the intuition is that when epsilon equals to zero, I get back my OT problem between rho naught and rho one. And if rho naught and rho one have densities, which is what I've assumed, then the solution is degenerate. The solution is given by is the identity and the gradient of phi push forward by rho, rho naught. And here gradient of phi is my Brunier map transporting rho naught to rho one. Now this is a highly degenerate solution. And if it has a highly degenerate solution, this has infinite entropy. And this solution, has entropy infinity. And the other problem, among many other problems as you will see, the, uh, one of the other problems that this is, has is that it's non-robust. Uh, by that I mean that if you change rho naught, if you change rho naught to something slightly different to rho naught prime, the solution can change drastically. the optimal solution changes drastically. Right? And so, um, therefore, if you're trying to do statistics, and if you don't actually know what rho naught and rho naught prime, if you do actually do not know rho naught and rho one, you only have an empirical estimate from data, uh, making slight 
changes if if your if your solution is non robust that creates a problem because that means you can't really estimate it from your data and so as a as a solution to very various of these different problems like this uh, this entropy regularization problem became very popular and i want to express it first in terms of the schrodinger bridge problem as we have done before and so to do this i'm going to define So Schrodinger bridge problem. And to get to the Schrodinger bridge problem, I'm going to define what is called a base measure. So what is a base measure? If you recall my description of the Schrodinger bridge, base measure is when I start my particle system at time zero from X and let them evolve as Brownian motion. What does it mean to let them evolve by Brownian motion? It means that the transition probability of Y given X is going to follow the standard Gaussian transition probability. So it's going to be one over square root two pi epsilon to the power d, e to the power minus norm of y minus x norm square over two epsilon. And that's what is going to be, I'm going to call my r epsilon of x, y. So again, this is what I'm doing here is that your particle system at time zero at time zero follows rho naught, and then they, they move according to Brownian transition Brownian transition with temperature epsilon. Now this is my base measure. And now I'm going to take relative entropy with respect to this base measure, or kubek leibler with respect to this base measure. And so what I'm going to look into is I'm going to solve the following problem in femum of gamma in pi rho naught to rho one, the kubek leibler divergence from gamma to r epsilon of xy. So just r epsilon. Now, this is my solution of the Schrodinger bridge. This is my Brown in motion. The solution here is Brown in motion, conditioned to be uh, rho naught at time zero and rho one at time one. Now, I'm being very vague here. What do I mean by condition? But there's some at, at some point in the lecture, I've described this large deviation and Gibbs conditioning principle behind this. Now, these two problems, the EOT problem and this kullback leibler problem, they are related. And the way to see this, that these two are related, is to simply expand this kullback leibler If you expand this kullback leibler you will get that this is exactly equal to this, this term plus the entropy term plus some constants. The constants don't matter and so essentially what we recover is that the solutions are the same. So the arg inf of the EOT problem in, in gamma over the set of couplings is also equal to the arg inf of the this kullback leibler problem. Yeah, the, it's the same. But also there is much, uh, there is other similarities. Here. Again, if I expand this Kullback library, as I said, if I take this Kullback library and if I expand this, I would get these two terms plus some other constants. And those constants really don't matter. They don't depend on the coupling at all. So these two problems are much more closely related than just by the argument. The values of these problems are also related. So we'll explore some of these connections. But before we go, I want to say a fundamental theorem about how the solution actually this argument looks like. So how does this argument look like? A fundamental theorem due to Ruschendorf and Thompson
building on prior work of Sizer, says that this optimal solution must be of a very particular form. And what is that particular form? That gamma epsilon star of xy, this is this optimal solution here. Yeah. First of all, it must have a density. It must have a density because otherwise the entropy is infinity and that cannot be the optimal solution. It must have a density. This gamma epsilon star xy is of the form, I will have this e to the power minus one over two epsilon norm of x minus y squared. And then there would be some potentials. I will have a epsilon of x over epsilon and I will have b epsilon of y over epsilon, which means there exists some a epsilon and b epsilon such that uh, this above holds. Now, this is remarkable because what it shows here is that the optimal solution, the Schrodinger bridge problem, this one or that one, whatever you look at, this is a distortion of the transition density of Brownian motion itself. This, this, is, the, this is my Brownian transition density. But the distortion doesn't depend on x, y pair. It only depends fully on x by some function a epsilon of x and fully by y by some other function b epsilon of y. There must exist some a epsilon and some b epsilon such that this potent, this gamma epsilon star of x uh, must be the optimal solution for this entropy optimal, entropy regularized optimal transport. In particular, what it means that it must belong to the coupling It must belong to the coupling, which means that gamma epsilon star of xy, if I integrate with respect to dx, I get rho one of y. If I integrate gamma epsilon star xy with respect to y, I get rho naught of y. So there will exist some a epsilon and b epsilon so that this will always be true. And there is only a unique one. And the one that you find is the optimal one. Good. Any questions on this? So I'm not going to prove this. Uh, I encourage you to read uh, Ruschendorf and Thompson's paper, but at least read the Sizer's paper. It's a, it's a really fundamental paper. There are many different proofs. Um, the one that I like the best is the one that is based on Sizer's paper because it's based on information geometry, a uh, field that is close to my heart. But I want to give some idea of why, why you would expect such a thing to be true. So some idea of how the proof goes. Why this is true. So there's a problem that we have already done before in this class. And the problem looks like this. Um, this, if you take infimum over all probability distributions gamma, some integral of Vx, so say, let's say Vz gamma dz plus entropy of gamma. And if I look into arg inf, so what is the probability distribution that minimizes this following quantity integral of Vz gamma dz plus entropy of gamma? And we have discussed the, uh, how the solution looks like. Does anybody remember how the solution looks like? What is the minimum entropy, min solution of this entropy plus a potential energy function. We did several examples like this, where we were minimizing entropy with some potential energies. Does anybody remember how this argin looks like? It's a Gibbs measure, exactly. So this argin essentially looks like this, e to the power minus vx, and then you have to like normalize it. So one over z, e to the power minus vx. This is the Gibbs measure. Now, what I want to do is that this is my unconstrained optimization. Optimization. 
I suppose uh, optimization. Uh, uh, suppose I want to do a constrained version of this. So what is a constrained version of this? A constrained version would be something like this. Let's say argin of the same thing, integral of Vz gamma dz plus entropy of gamma. And then I have a constraint over all gamma, so that let's say integral of Fz gamma dz is equal to a constant C0. Okay, I, could, I could put an F0. So F0 of z gamma dz is equal to C0. Now, how will I do a constrained optimization? Well, there's this wonderful method called Lagrange multipliers, which you may, must have heard at some point. So I can use my Lagrange multipliers. And I can transform my constrained problem to an unconstrained problem by using a Lagrange multiplier. So I can try to look into arginf integral of Vz gamma dz plus entropy of gamma, and then plus some lambda naught, and I do integral of f naught of z uh, gamma dz minus c naught. And then I would take an argin for all unconstrained measures. And then I would put the constraint for the for the Lagrange multiplier itself that I should satisfy f zero z gamma dz is equal to c zero. So I have to satisfy both of these. Does it make sense? So if I want to do a constrained optimization, I turn it to an unconstrained optimization by adding a Lagrange multiplier. But now I know the solution of this. I know the solution of this uh, of this um, unconstrained problem. It's a Gibbs measure. And so this uh, solution would look like e to the power minus vz minus some constant, maybe put alpha one, let's say, so or alpha naught, if not of z. Okay, that's going to be my argument. It must look like this because I have a potential function and I have entropy and I'm taking argin for this. It must look like this. And then what is this alpha naught? That alpha naught will be chosen such that that if I integrate this, so I'm going to write this as gamma star of z. So that if I integrate gamma star of z, so f naught of z, gamma star of dz, uh, or rather z dz, because this is just a density, I will get exactly c naught. So uh, can I say that there will always exist such an alpha naught such that there is such a problem is satisfied? Yes, under mild assumptions, you could say that. You can say that. There is some mild assumptions that you have to satisfy for which you have to say that. But the solution must look like this. It must be a Gibbs measure which must be of the type integral V0 gamma and alpha naught F0 of Z, and it must look like this, must be C0. Does this make sense? Now this problem, when I'm putting, an, I'm putting a problem on the set of couplings, is nothing but the same problem as that other a constraint problem, except the constraint, there are countably infinitely many such constraints. So what do I mean by this? If I go back to now the problem on uh, the EOT problem, EOT rho naught and rho one. So I'm going to take my Z to be my couplet X and Y. Now, if I want to say that gamma belongs to some coupling of rho naught and rho one, I can demand a countable set of const linear constraints on gamma. So for example, suppose everything is determined by, uh, by moments. This, doesn't, this is not necessary, but for simplicity, assume everything is determined by moments. Then I can simply assume that you know, x to the power k gamma dz, this should be equal to x to the power k rho naught d, uh, dx. 
uh, for all k in n. And y to the power k gamma dz should be equal to y to the power of k um, uh, rho 1 dy for all k in n, or rather n to the power d, let's say, all multi-moments. If everything is determined by moments, then this is a countable collection of linear constraints. It doesn't have to be determined by moments. We're working on a separable set. So there is some countable collection of bases that it can separate. we can um, choose such that if a measure satisfies a countably many a linear constraint, it will be in this set of couplings. Is this clear? Then once you do this, then you put these countably many Lagrange multipliers. Countably many Lagrange multipliers, and what you recover that gamma epsilon star xy would be given by e to the power minus one half two over epsilon norm of x minus y square, which is the first term that is over here, which is this first term over here. Uh, okay, so epsilon will go to the other side, but it's it's this uh, one over two epsilon uh, norm of x minus y square. And now I get these terms minus a epsilon of x over epsilon minus b epsilon of y over epsilon. And the reason that these functions only depend on x and y, because my countable set of constraints are only dependent on x and y. There is no constraint that depends on the pair x, y. It's all x or all y. And therefore, the Lagrange multipliers are only dependent either on x or on y. So the real proof is just an abstraction of the same idea, but hopefully this is a believable intuition of why this must be the case. Good. Any questions? You guys are okay? All right, okay. Now moving into asymptotics. So what happens as epsilon goes to zero? As epsilon goes down to zero. So if you if you look into again the EOT problem, the EOT problem here, rho naught and rho one, this is the infimum over set of couplings. of uh, one half norm of y minus x norm square d gamma plus epsilon entropy of gamma. So it makes sense to think that as epsilon goes to zero, as epsilon goes down to zero, that this should converge to the one half w2 square distance between rho naught and rho one. That's a natural guess, right? Because at epsilon equals to zero, I recovered the one half W2 square. Well, is this true? Uh, the answer is yes. And this is in the original paper of Mikami who started this whole Schrodinger Briggs, Schrodinger Briggs business. So this is a theorem due to Mikami. And it was later generalized by Leonard. For all other cost functions. Um, so the theorem says that if rho naught and rho one have finite second moments, then this is true. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. So then, this is true that um, that the co the UT cost function converges to this uh, the optimal transport cost function as epsilon goes to zero. But what about the the optimizers? Uh, does gamma epsilon star converge as epsilon goes to zero 
to the optimal transport map, which again, in this case is identity gradient of phi, which followed by rho naught. Uh, Mikami also established this to be true. So in his paper, he says, yes, if both entropy of rho naught and entropy of rho one are finite. Uh, again, in Leonard's survey article, there is a, I don't think it's fully known for what, what cost functions this is true, but certainly there's some generalizations that's known. But for the quadratic cost function, this was in, in original Mikami's paper. Is this clear, what I'm saying? So as epsilon goes down to zero, your, uh, your discount of entropy is getting smaller and smaller. And so your map gets more and more degenerate until it converges to the Brunier map. Okay, good. You can ask this question about the rate of convergence. So at what rate is this convergence happening? And here's an interesting thing here, which is that look into this look into this object here. If you look into this object here, I can look into two things here. One, one is, I can divide by epsilon. So I can look into one over two epsilon. Um, so what I'm trying to say is this following. So look into one over epsilon, EOT of epsilon of rho naught rho one. If you do this, and then you get that this is equal to the infimum over the set of couplings, rho naught and rho one. Then I get uh, this is one over two epsilon norm of y minus x norm square d gamma plus entropy of gamma. Now this seems like a very bad thing to do. Why? Because as epsilon is going to zero, this is exploding to infinity this is exploding to infinity, this is exploding to infinity, everything is blowing up to infinity. It's like a very, very bad idea to do this. But it's not so bad. If you slightly change the problem from EOT over epsilon to epsilon, instead if you look into this relative entropy, the Schrodinger bridge problem, which was here, look into this kullback leibler problem, gamma to R epsilon, then there's a nice result that if you look into the infimum of kullback leibler of this, so in this case, this is just gamma epsilon star. So infimum over coupling of rho naught to rho one, um, gamma over R epsilon. So R epsilon, remember, this is the natural way that Brown in motion would move starting from rho naught. Then um, this limit, as epsilon goes to zero of this quantity minus one over two epsilon W2 square rho naught to rho one. This actually has a limit, which is one half entropy of rho one minus entropy of rho naught. The reason this is a nice result is that again, as I'm saying, uh, this quantity is by itself is going to infinity because this is approximately that, is one over epsilon the EOT cost. So this quantity is going to infinity. This quantity is also going to infinity because this is approximately this first term, this one over two epsilon norm of y minus epsilon x squared. This is also going to infinity. However, the difference between these two is actually finite and not just it's finite, it only depends on the two marginals, so rho one and rho naught, and it's just the difference between these two entropies. So this result is in a paper of mine and also simultaneously uh, by Conforti and Tamamini. And I will see the distinction. So in my paper, they, they have slightly different, they have different assumptions for which these two whole things hold. 
And in my paper, I do cover other cost functions, not just uh, not just the quadratic cost. There's a whole set of costs for which you can do this kind of limits. And uh, in Confortian and Tamamini, they actually find the, the, uh, the error between these two as well. And so they have this beautiful result, which says that if you look into this kullback leibler in FEMA, so by the way, I want to again make sure that this is exactly equal to the kullback leibler divergence between my gamma epsilon star, the solution of the EOT problem, from my base measure R epsilon. And if you subtract of one over two epsilon, W2 square, rho naught and rho one, then this is greater than or equal to zero. And this is less than or equal to the limit that I'm claiming here, which is the entropy of rho one minus the entropy of rho naught. And then plus epsilon over eight integral from zero to one I of rho T dt, where what is I of rho? So rho T, T between zero and one is a constant speed geodesic joining rho naught and rho one. Joining rho naught and rho one. And I of rho is a Fisher information. which is the integral from zero to one, the gradient of log rho, norm square, uh, d rho. Okay, so let's recall again what I'm trying to say here. What I'm trying to say here is that it is fairly easy to see that the entropy regularized optimal transport cost is converging to the Wasserstein two optimal transport cost between rho naught and rho one. What is the rate of convergence? The rate of convergence is order epsilon, in the sense that if you divide by both sides by order epsilon, so if you divide this guy by order epsilon, and if you divide the Wasserstein two square cost by order epsilon, then the difference is actually some finite quantity. They both go to infinity, but the difference is order one. And not just that, this is again, this is not just true for quadratic costs, but this is true for a wide variety of costs. But not just that, you can also bound the difference between these two for positive epsilon. In fact, this is true for all epsilon positive. For all epsilon positive, you have the kullback the difference between these two is bounded by the limit and something that depends on the constant speed geodesic joining the two endpoints, rho naught and rho one. You integrate the Fisher information from rho naught to rho one. Do you understand the statement? You guys have any questions? Are you following what I'm saying? All right, okay, good. Um, again, I'm not going to give, it is not possible for me to give the proofs of these results. They are complicated. I want to give an intuition behind this result. And so I'll, I'll take this intuition from my own paper. So there's an intuition here. And the intuition is that for small values of epsilon, gamma, gamma epsilon star has a Gaussian approximation. For epsilon small, gamma epsilon star, which is the optimal uh, entropy regular's optimal transport problem solution, has the following Gaussian approximation. And the Gaussian approximation is a gamma epsilon star xy is approximately a rho naught of x. And then you, so you select y from x from a Gaussian distribution. And what is this Gaussian distribution? Well, this is normal where the mean of y is the optimal Brunier map and the covariance of y is epsilon times the Hessian of the dual potential. So, so okay, so I, I will write this down. So what I try to say, 
has the following Gaussian approximation. If x comma y is sampled from gamma x gamma epsilon star x y, then x has a distribution rho and y given x equals to x, small x, is distributed as a multivariate Gaussian minor variable with a mean that is x star and a covariance that is epsilon times Hessian of phi star of x star, where x star is a gradient of phi of x is the um, optimal map, optimal Bernier map. And uh, Hessian of phi star, this is the Hessian of the convex conjugate phi star of phi, and then you evaluate it at x star. So to understand what this is saying, you should understand what is the, as epsilon goes to zero, if I start my x as when epsilon is equal to zero, it tries to stay near x star. That's my optimal Brunier potential. Now, when epsilon is non-zero, when epsilon is positive, it tries to stay in a Gaussian fluctuation around x star, around the mean x star. Now this Gaussian fluctuation, it has some elliptic level sets of this Gaussian potential. And what is this elliptic level set? Well, first of all, the length of these ellipses is given is of the order epsilon, which means as epsilon goes to zero, they shrink. And the axis of these ellipses are given by the eigenvectors of the Hessian of the convex conjugate of the Brunier map, evaluated at x star. Okay, so depending on this Hessian, you can expect it to fluctuate more or less. So if the Hessian of phi star of x star is large, then you would expect that you would have a lot of fluctuations of your of your um, uh, EOT optimal solution from the optimal map, optimal Brunier map. But if this Hessian is small, then you'll have much less fluctuation. I want to stress this role that this Hessian is playing here because this will come up again in my next class when we establish the connection with the parabolic Mojampe. This Hessian part is very important. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, this is of course not exactly equal. I'm not saying that the optimal, the Schrodinger's problems is exactly this Gaussian distribution. It is not. It doesn't respect the marginal distributions. It is only approximately to be true. And the approximation is stronger and stronger as you take epsilon going to zero, strong enough to get this limit. Okay, so, but I want you to remember that the how tight your approximation is locally is there something special about the convex conjugate of the Brunier map? Uh, sorry if I missed something. Um, why is it? Why is the convex conjugate of the Brunier map comes up here? Uh, I don't have a good answer to this, but it seems to be it seems to be everywhere here. I, I will give other examples there, but it seems to be everywhere here. It's, I don't think it's. Uh, I don't think I understand it very fully. Why this is the particular thing to look at, but you construct this approximation and it works out fine. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, moving on. What else do we know about these potential functions? So recall. that gamma epsilon xy, this optimal gamma epsilon star xy looks like this. So this is exponential of minus one over two epsilon norm of x minus y norm square minus a epsilon of x epsilon minus b epsilon of y over epsilon. 
um, there's a bit of a confusion in the literature about how you want to write these potentials, because sometimes it is convenient to write it in this way. This is the exponential uh, x dot y over epsilon uh, minus phi epsilon of x epsilon minus psi, uh, psi epsilon of y over epsilon. And then um, you look, you write it down as uh, rho naught of x, rho one of y. These are equivalent ways of simply writing this. All I'm simply doing is that I'm opening up the square. I'm opening up the square and I'm just shuffling terms from one to the other so that they get this right form. The reason sometimes you need to do this is because some of these terms, they converge to the Brunier map. Some of these terms converge to the Kantorovich map, and these potentials are slightly different from each other, and you need to you need to subtract of the right terms when you have the right limit. All right, okay. So I know something about limits. I know something about what is happening as epsilon goes to zero. I know that um, uh, these are converging to the Brunier. These are converging to the optimal transport map. But what else can I say about this a epsilon and b epsilon for positive epsilon? Well, there's a beautiful result, which is inspired by a famous theorem of Caffarelli called the Caffarelli contraction theorem. So Caffarelli contraction theorem says the following. If I have a probability two probability measures, P and Q, say P is e to the power minus V and Q is e to the power minus W, and I have a gradient of phi that transports my P to Q is Q. When can I say uh, that gradient of phi, this map, x going to gradient of phi of x, this map is Lipschitz? That seems a natural question to ask. I can ask whether this map is continuous. I can ask whether this map is Lipschitz. And as Jan has explained uh, to you in his regularity lecture, that this is a non-trivial question to ask. It's not always clear when an optimal transport mass map has nice regularity features. And by the way, everything that I have said so far, you know, even in the case of epsilon going to zero, these all require assumptions. I'm just pushing them under the rug, but they all require assumptions on their support, on the assumptions of their densities, behavior of densities, and so on. So um, a famous result with the Caffarelli says that if P is more log concave, so if Q is more log concave, than P, then um, uh, this is Lipschitz. So this map is Lipschitz. Now, what do I mean? So Q is more log concave than P means P is e to the power minus V, which means that if I look into W and V, then the Hessian of W, the Hessian of W is larger than the Hessian of V. Okay, it's, it's say something something like this, right? So if more log concave means that it has lighter tails in this convexity. So one prime example of this is that if you're transporting Gaussians. So for example, if P is your normal zero one, and if your Q is normal zero sigma square, well, let's say sigma square is less than one, then this is more log concave. because the density of Q has of the form e to the power minus z square over two sigma square, and P has e to the power minus z square over two, and this is more log concave. And lo and behold, if I want to map P to Q, my optimal transport map is x going to sigma of x, so sigma times x. And because sigma square is less than one, sigma is less than one, this is Lipschitz. Right, because I my P looks like this bell-shaped curve and my Q is a more contracted bell-shaped curve. It, it, it gets pushed more 
And so it makes sense that the optimal transport map from going from P to Q is Lipschitz. Does this make sense? So Kafferoni proved this general theorem. Uh, that's correct. In the in the order in the, this is in the order of positive semi-definite matrices, the PSD order. That's correct. So W minus V is is, is positive semi-definite. That's right. So in every direction, this is more convex. So the theorem due to Gaffarelli is the following: that if p is e to the power minus v, if q is e to the power minus w, these are smooth densities. on Rd, then the optimal transport map, so, uh, okay, so, and I need to assume something about it. Assume that the Hessian of V is in the PSD order smaller than beta times identity, and the Hessian of W in the PSD order is larger than alpha times identity, then the optimal transport map ready to phi from P to Q is square root of beta over lambda Lipschitz. In, uh, in this example where the sigma is less than one or greater than one, that's correct. Sigma going to X sigma is, is Lipschitz. That's correct. And you see this is covered by the general theorem I wrote down. So I'm not assuming that alpha is larger than beta or anything like that. I'm saying that if the Hessian of V is more log concave, uh, is Hessian of V is less log concave than a Gaussian with beta. And if, he and if, uh, and if Q is more, log con is more log concave than a Gaussian with alpha, then the optimal transport map from P to Q is square root of beta over alpha Lipschitz. Beta over alpha could be larger than one, could be smaller than one, but these are pretty strong assumptions. Clear? Yeah. So in my previous case, I would take alpha to be larger than beta. And so then, then V is smaller, and then W is more, w is more convex, V is less convex, and I would get one Lipschitz. It doesn't have to be so. Okay, so this is the theorem of due to Caffarelli. Uh, the theorem is non-trivial to prove. The theorem is actually quite hard to prove. It requires some regularity theory. So this is, as I said, this is due to Caffarelli. This is a highly non-trivial theorem to prove. But uh, there's a, a theorem due to, recently due to Cherry and Pulladian. who showed that a similar theorem is true for the, um, the optimal Schrodinger bridge, and it's actually much easier to prove. So the Chile, Chile and Podadian, and, and they actually derive Caffarelli's theorem from there. So here is their theorem. Um, P is e to the power minus V, Q is e to the power minus W. Again, there are some regularity assumptions here that I'm not saying anything. Uh, Hessian of V is in the PSD order, smaller than beta times identity. Hessian of W is again in the PSD order, larger than alpha times identity. Then if I write my optimal um, EOT coupling as gamma epsilon star of X, the gamma epsilon star XY is exponential minus phi epsilon of X over epsilon minus psi epsilon of y over epsilon minus one over epsilon x dot y. And then I would put e to the power minus vx, e to the power minus wy. Then we would get that the Hessian of phi epsilon of x, this is in the PSD order, always smaller than one half, square root four beta over alpha 
plus epsilon square beta square minus epsilon beta times identity. And a similar result goes for the other guy. Okay, so what I want you to notice from here, okay, this is a complicated expression. What I want you to notice here, one is that this is true for all epsilon positive, and two is that as epsilon goes down to zero, I recover Caffarelli's bound. Because as epsilon goes to zero, these epsilon terms is cancel out. I get four beta over alpha, then square root of four cancels with T, I get square root of beta over alpha, which is what Caffarelli said. Okay. Um, so some of this, uh, I, I'm saying this is true in Polonian, but their, their result is actually strongly influenced but, uh, by an earlier result. And this is this beautiful paper by uh, Fatih, Goslan, okay, now, who is the third author? And now I'm escaping my mind, so give me a moment to look it up. Prudhomme. Oh, yes, thank you, Gary. Prudhomme. Prudhomme. Uh, who they prove they prove Caffarelli's contraction theorem contraction theorem using EOT. So they prove actually Caffarelli's contraction theorem using EOT. The entropy regularized optimal transport problem, but this exact statement they don't state. They use, we are soon coming to this, Sinkhans algorithm to prove this Caffarelli's theorem, but this statement that for positive, for a positive epsilon, you, you actually get the similar result of Caffarelli and it's much easier to prove in this case is due to Chevy and Palladian. Good. Um, other than that, uh, we know weaker results. We know results, for example, about you know smoothness. So other than this, by the way, do you guys follow what what I'm saying here? So for every positive epsilon, I get an epsilon dependence, but I still get this Lipschizness of the transport map uh, from here. All right. Okay. Now, uh, as you, as you, as I said, as I said before, that you know that that uh, I want my EOT problem is more robust. Is more robust to input. And um, how do I know this? Well, there is very recent work of Carly, Shiza, and Laborde. And again, I'm not going to state their whole theorem with all their assumptions. Carly, Shiza, and Laborde, who show the following, that, um, that this map, so that, that these potentials, phi epsilon and psi epsilon, these potentials, as a function of the input, rho naught and rho one, uh, they are smooth. So in this, they are Lipschitz, in fact. So define a map, calligraphic S, that takes the input vectors rho naught and rho one and outputs these maps phi epsilon and psi epsilon. And this S is, is Lipschitz, and they choose a particular map, a particular norm that S rho naught rho one minus S rho naught prime rho one prime. These two things. Uh, these two maps, there is some uniform norm that you have to look up from their paper. There's some uniform in the space of continuously differentiable maps. This is bounded by some constant C, which depends on epsilon. And then the W2 distance between rho naught and rho one, rho naught prime, and W2 distance 
between row one and row one prime. Okay, so as your as your measures get close, your potentials get close. So there is there is a smoothness, there is in, in, lipschitzness. Uh, this dependence on epsilon, typically in all these problems, the dependence on epsilon is pretty bad. Uh, so these constants they blow up exponentially, sometimes super exponentially as epsilon goes to zero. And that is because regularity for optimal transport maps is pretty bad. But uh, for epsilon positive, you expect all kinds of smoothness, re smoothness results. And a lot of modern research is in recovering the smoothness results. That's what people have been busy doing. Is this clear? Any questions? All right, okay. So moving on, I want to give I want to br uh, briefly um, survey a little bit of the statistical work here from, because that's where a lot of these activities are coming from. So a brief, hist a brief survey of the statistical work. And the first question, that we encounter is that suppose I'm given rho naught on row one, how to estimate W2 squared distance between rho naught and rho one? If I'm given two densities, how do I estimate the W2 squared distance between rho naught and rho one? That's a very natural question. Now, as a statistician, you don't know what these rho naughts and rho one are. What you have in mind is an empirical distribution. So you have IID samples. x1, x2 up to xn, which are coming from IID from rho naught, and y1, y2 up to yn, which are IID from rho 1. And you look into the empirical distribution, rho naught hat, which is 1 over n, i equals to 1 to n delta of xi, and rho 1 hat, which is 1 over n, summation of i equals to 1 to n delta of y i, y g or y i hat, delta of y i. And what you can compute is w2 square between rho naught hat and rho 1 hat. And the question that you should ask is that, is this a consistent estimate? Is this true that if I take this limit, I would get w2 square between rho naught and rho 1? Is this clear? So that's a general statistical problem. The statistical problem is that I don't have access to the measures themselves. I only have problems. So there's a randomness here, but the randomness is coming from these observations themselves. So there's, there's the, the observations are random. So this is a random variable. And what you're really looking for is some kind of almost sure or improbability convergence. Good. The good news is that yes, it is consistent. So good news is, is that yes, this is consistent. So Fournier and Guillain. Uh, based on other earlier works, gives this, they give the best answers, the sharpest answers. Show consistency for the limit holes. But the rate is terrible. The rate of convergence is terrible. Is of the order n to the power minus two over d, where d is the dimension of the data. And this cannot be improved in general. This is sharp. There are cases where you actually get this rate. So yes, it is consistent. Yes, you would be able to uh, estimate your W2 square rho naught and rho one by taking IID data. But in practice, you can never do this. Because typically statisticians would be working with a dimension of, I don't know, 50 or 100 at least. And then n to the power minus two over 50 is like n to the power minus one over 25. This is a pathetically slow rate when really what you want to have rate is like n to the power minus one half. The rate of central limit theorem is what you typically work with. 
this is uh, one of the biggest stumbling blocks of using optimal transport in statistics. That if you can't even estimate the optimal transport cost from your data, well, what is the math good for? Is this clear? The good news is that if you put a small bit of epsilon, then your problem vanishes. And this was, again, one more reason why this became so popular, that EOT epsilon can be estimated essentially in a dimension-free way. I'm lying a bit, and I will clarify where I'm lying. And here's a statement, which is from, so Mena Nilesweed. So it's a theorem due to Mena and Nilesweed, who show that if rho naught and rho one are sub-Gaussian, which means that they are sub-Gaussian tails, so their tails are at least, can, can only grow at most as Gaussian, so Gaussian or sharp or decay, then um, you can estimate EOT, so EOT, epsilon, rho naught and rho one can be estimated from data in order of n to the power minus one half, great. So you can build statistical estimates. There are several of them actually, such that if you do this, if you if you're trying to estimate the entropy regularized optimal transport cost for any positive epsilon, uh, this converges to the actual estimate at order of n to the power minus one half, dimension independent. The catch is that this order here depends on a constant. Here is where epsilon comes in. On epsilon. And this is typically exponential in epsilon. So I don't have the dimension dependence here. That goes away. But I still have the demand, I still have the problem with epsilon. And so that epsilon will enter into that constant sitting there. And that would typically e to the power minus one over epsilon, some large constant. But okay, at least it doesn't have dimension dependence. Am I making sense? Are you, are you guys following? You, can you can I hear some? I, I do you understand what I'm trying to say here? So if you're trying to estimate, okay, good. So if you're trying to estimate the optimal transport cost in general for statistics, at least for practical purposes, there is no hope. You put a little bit of epsilon, suddenly there is hope, and you can essentially do this. And so it's and so if the only thing that you can estimate is EOT of epsilon it becomes more important to understand how much is the deviation of the entropy regularized optimal transport map from the actual optimal transport map. And that's where this theory comes up that I've been doing so far. Okay, that's the math part comes up there. All right, okay, good. Um, so maybe I cannot estimate that, but what about central limit theorem? What about fluctuations about this uh, estimates? So there, the news is even worse for if you're trying to estimate optimal transport costs. So what about central limit theorems? So what about central limit theorems? Now I'm, I'm seeing central limit theorem in a very loose way. I'm really talking about fluctuations around estimates. So what I mean is this. So I let's suppose I have some rho naught and rho one. So I have some rho naught and rho one. And I want to estimate one half W2 square, rho naught and rho one. Now there is an estimate from the data that I can do, which is W2 square, rho naught hat and rho one hat, where rho naught hat is one over N, summation delta of Xi, and rho one hat is one over N, summation of delta of Yg. As I said, there is consistency. You can prove painfully slowly, maybe, but you can prove 
that my estimate is consistent. It does converge to where it is supposed to be going. But what about the fluctuation? In other words, if I look at the difference of W2 square, rho naught hat, rho one hat, if I subtract off W2 square, rho naught and rho one, if I maybe, for example, you know, multiply or divide by some, let's say, you know, n to the power minus alpha, does this go to some normal, some standard normal zero sigma square limit? Okay. That would give you a, a central limit theorem kind of result. And then statisticians can use this to get a confidence interval of this estimate around the true unknown value. Do you understand this? This is simply doesn't hold. And the reason this does not hold here is that for the following bizarre scenario is that W2 square rho naught hat minus rho one hat minus its own expected value, W2 square rho naught hat rho one hat. This satisfies the central limit theorem. If you look into square root of n of this, this converges to some normal zero sigma square. But this bias, which is this expected value of W2 square of rho naught hat and rho one hat, which nobody knows what this is, this is an unknown quantity. This minus the actual quantity W2 square rho naught and rho one, this is again order of n to the power minus two over d. So if you subtract this off, there is no such central limit theorem that's going to hold. You understand what I'm saying? This result is due to Del Barrio and Lubis. So not only you can't, not only the not only the estimate is painfully slow, you simply cannot have a Gaussian sen uh, or fluctuation around what you're trying to estimate, so that you can get us you can get some confidence interval to find out how good is your estimate around its around what you're trying to estimate. There is simply no hope there. Am I making sense? The bias is larger than the variance. It's the bias in the estimate is much, much larger than the variance of the estimate. So this simply doesn't work. On the other hand, if you have a little bit of epsilon, for all those positive epsilon, you have a central limit theorem. Okay. On the other hand, there is a central limit theorem. There is Gaussian fluctuation for positive actual epsilon. For any epsilon positive. And this theorem that I'm going to write down is due to uh, Gonzalez, Sanz, Lupus, and Nan Sweet. Gonzalez Sanz, uh, Lubis, and Nan Sweet. And uh, they showed this, this was conjectured, this particular theorem was conjectured in a paper with uh, of mine with uh, Zaid Ashavi, uh, Lang Liu, and myself. And what they showed is this, if you compute this database entropy regularized optimal transport, rho one hat, and if you subtract off this, the actual EOT of rho one and rho, 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 rho naught and rho one, and if you multiply by square root of n, uh, so this is square root of n, I think I'm writing this correctly, then this will converge to Gaussian with a mean zero and a variance sigma square. And this sigma square has a very particular expression. So this is known what this sigma square is. Okay, And this is for rho naught not equal to rho one. And there is another way there is for rho naught equal to rho one, you can also do this. Okay, So again, as we see from here, I'm simplifying the matter. There, there, is some, there, there are some assumptions here. There is some expression here. But again, you can look into this paper 
where they actually prove this kind of central limit theorem. But again, the, pro the point I'm trying to make here is that um, that if you look into, if you, if you add a little bit of noise, if you add a little bit of regularization with positive epsilon, and then you recover all the classical statistical properties. You have consistent estimates, the eps the the you have consistency of the order of one over square root of n, so no no course of dimensionality, as they say, and you have central limit theorem, which gives you Gaussian fluctuations around your estimate, and therefore um, uh, um, confidence interval. Good. Uh, Youngman has already talked about, so of course, this is not how originally the thing came up. The originally the popularity of the intravirus gross optimal transport was due to computational advantage. And Youngman, I think, has already talked about it, so I don't have to talk about it, that if you want to do, if you want to solve the matching problem, then the, the complexity of this is about n cube log n. But if you, if you do the intravirus gross optimal transport problem, the complexity, the it goes to n square log n. So you gain a factor of n, which is very easy. And the synchron algorithm, which is what's coming next, allows us to compute in parallel. So let's go to the synchron algorithm. So the synchron algorithm is what is used for computation. Now, because I'm going to do it in densities, for densities, uh, the synchron algorithm has a different name, which is more classical. It is called the IPFP algorithm. These are the same thing. So this is iterated proportional fitting procedure. Again, Youngman has already explained this. So the difference between synchron and IPFP is a synchron is typically for matrices, and IPFP is for densities. That's the only difference. There is no other difference. It's exactly the same algorithm. So either synchron or IPFP algorithm is used to actually compute this EOT epsilon, the entropy regularized optimal transport. So let's just briefly recall how this algorithm looks like. So recall how this how this IPFP algorithm looks like. So um, I have my row naught, I have my row one, and I want to figure out what is my gamma epsilon star of x y, which is my optimal trans optimal entropy regularized solution, which looks like this: exponential minus one over two epsilon norm of x minus y norm square minus a epsilon of x over epsilon minus b epsilon of y over epsilon. So what IPFP does or synchron does is that it tries to, it's an iterative algorithm. So synchron is an iterative algorithm. Algorithm to compute gamma epsilon star. You can start from anywhere. So you can start from, let's say, gamma zero of x, y to be, um, let's say, uh, rho naught of x, and then e to the power minus one over two epsilon norm of x minus y norm square, and you divide by one over square root two pi epsilon to the power d. If you recall, this was my base measure, r epsilon x, y. This is how my Brownian motion is supposed to behave. Now, when you look at gamma zero x, y, you would notice that it's x coordinate. So pi x, it's x coordinate of gamma zero is rho zero. So if you project it on the marginal distribution of the x coordinate, it's rho zero. The problem is that it's y coordinate is not row one. If it were row one, then I would be done. But it's not row one, typically. So what I would do here is that I would try to make it row one. How will I make it row one? Well, I'm going to compute my pi epsilon of row naught. So compute the y marginal. So let's say the y marginal, I'm going to denote it by 
uh, it, uh, I'm going to denote it by nu. So nu zero of y, this is the integral of gamma zero x y dx. This is my y marginal. And so what I'm going to define now is that I'm going to define my gamma zero prime of x y to be my gamma zero x y. And then I'm going to divide it by nu zero of y. And I'm going to multiply this by rho one of y. Okay, so what have I done here? I've introduced a factor which is only depends on y. So my new, my new uh, thing looks like something like exponential of minus one over two epsilon norm of x minus y norm square. And then I have some other terms that are coming up here. So I have some term, which is let's say phi zero of x over epsilon minus psi zero prime of y over epsilon. Some other terms that are coming from here. So first of all, is this a probability density? Is this a density? Well, how do I claim that this is a density? Well, this is clearly non-negative and I have to check that this integrates to one. Well, I'll leave it for you as a verification to check that if you integrate this, you get exactly one. So this is the joint density. Now, what happens to the um, y marginal now? If I integrate my gamma zero prime x, y, and if I integrate with respect to dx, I see what I get is nu zero of y, rho one of y over nu zero of y. These two cancels out and I get rho one of y. So by, by doing this ratio on the y side, I now get the right y marginal, but of course I got a price to pay. What is the price I am paying? That gamma zero prime x y dy is no longer rho naught of x. Are you guys following what I'm saying? Okay. So I've matched, this is my iterated proportional fitting. I fit my y marginal to what I want. So the price that I've paid here is that my x marginal is now being distorted and not run out anymore. Now to fix this, I would now run the next step. So what will I do? I would define my gamma one of x, y, to be my gamma zero prime of x, y. And then I'm going to define, let's say mu zero of x to be the x marginal, gamma zero prime x, y, dy. I will divide by mu zero of x and I would multiply by rho naught of x. The effect of this is that again, I get a density which looks like this, joint density, one over two epsilon, x minus y norm square minus phi one of x over epsilon minus psi naught prime of y over epsilon. Again, you have to verify that this is a joint density and this joint density will now satisfy that the x marginal uh, mu one is now rho naught and the y marginal is now shifted. Mu uh, uh, one is no longer row one. And so you continue go on doing this. So you continue going doing this. So every odd step, every odd step, you get some, um, uh, you get some gamma. So every odd step and call this odd step to be, let's say two K minus one. So you get some gamma k prime x, y, which has the correct y marginal. Rho one and incorrect x marginal. With incorrect x marginal, call this x marginal to be my, according to my notation, mu k, which is not rho naught. I think mu k minus one. And every even step, two k, I get gamma k. Uh, I think I think this is k minus one, and this is gamma k x y, and this will have the wrong y marginal, which is uh, new k 
k, which is not rho naught, rho one, but it will have the correct x marginal. Um, uh, mu k equals to rho naught. All of these would look like this. They would all look like exponential of minus one over two epsilon, norm of y minus x norm square, minus some function. Uh, I'm going to definitely mess up my indices now, but likely this is going to be phi k of x over epsilon minus uh, psi k minus one prime y over epsilon. So they're all going to have some such form, but they're going to, one side is going to be fit and the other side is not going to fit. And the hope is that as k goes to infinity, my gamma k converges to gamma epsilon star as k goes to infinity. And therefore, after running a large number of steps, I have recovered my, um, I have recovered my, uh, the Schrodinger bridge that I wanted to recover. Is this clear? Okay, so that's the idea behind IPFP. Now, the next class, what we are going to see here, this seems like a, this seems like a reasonable algorithm. People use this a lot. However, we know very little about it. Uh, Youngman must have said that a Schrodinger algorithm converges exponentially fast. And that's true except it comes with caveats. It converges exponentially fast for positive epsilon, and we are looking into finitely many atoms. So you're actually doing matrix multiplication, not for continuous densities. For continuous densities, even for positive epsilons, it is not known when this converges exponentially fast. In fact, it is known, we can find examples where the convergence is very, very slow. But what is worse is that we want to figure out what happens when epsilon is very close to zero. And when epsilon is very close to zero, there, by now I will mention some of the results next time. By now we know some results when this converges exponentially fast, but none of them cover the case when epsilon is very close to zero. And what we would like to know is something about the behavior of this synchron algorithm as epsilon is close to zero. So the question is, is how does how does this synchron algorithm behave as epsilon is close to zero? And what do I mean by as uh, as as synchron? How does synchron behave as epsilon is close to zero? Well, again, we'll do this again in depth next time, but just for a preview. There are two ways to track this. One is that you look into these evolving potentials that are coming from the x coordinates. So you look into this phi one, look into phi two, and look into phi three as they are changing. But they actually depend on epsilon. So you have to put an epsilon, phi one of epsilon, phi two of epsilon, phi three of epsilon, and so on. Now, if you look into phi of k epsilon over epsilon and epsilon, and if you put k epsilon is equal to t, and you take epsilon goes to zero, then you can expect that this curve converges to some curve phi of t, for t greater than or equal to zero. Does this satisfy a partial differential equation? So that's a question to ask. So the sequence of potentials that I'm getting from every step of the synchron iteration, they are changing. They depend on epsilon. Now, as epsilon goes down to zero, they don't change too much at every step. So you kind of scale that whole parameter down into some continuous parameter. And in the limit, as epsilon goes to zero, you expect some kind of continuous family of evolving functions. Does this evolving function satisfy some PDE? You can also ask the same question for the sequence of measures that I'm getting, which are these mu one, then this mu k minus one, mu k, this sequence of measures. And I can look into mu epsilon of k epsilon, these kind of measures where k epsilon is t. So I would say t over epsilon rather. 
So k epsilon is t, epsilon is going to a to zero. So k is t over epsilon. So we look into t over epsilon. Does this converge to some, uh, some continuous curve mu t in the Wasserstein space? And does this satisfy a continuity equation? Okay, so these are natural questions to ask if I'm taking epsilon going down to zero and I'm taking some kind of scaling limits. And as we will see next time, it does satisfy the parabolic, uh, the, the, the speedy of this function satisfies the parabolic Mongean pair, which Young and introduced uh, last time. I understand the intuition why the marginals will match after I mean yeah, no no Vasily and the in the limit you are getting a joint distribution which looks like the cost function minus a epsilon minus b epsilon of y and it is it is in the it is in the set of couplings and if you have such a solution then it must minimize the the Kudak lambda divergence there is only one it's again that's the Gibbs measure it's by uniqueness exactly. Uh, the sequence of potentials that sat that satisfies the parabolic Monchamp. Uh, this is the uh, this is the this is the PD that Yang Hun introduced in his final class, last class. And uh, this this satisfies this satisfies the continuity equation. This is a this is a gradient flow, but not your regular gradient flows, not your Wasserstein regular gradient flow, but something called a mirror gradient flow. It's a, it's a gradient flow with respect to a distorted Wasserstein metric. Okay, so we will study both these limits in, um, in, on Thursday. Clear? All right, okay, so we'll stop here. Any questions? Okay. Uh, are the nice, so this is a very good question. Are the nice properties of the EOT also true if we substitute the regularizer with something else other than entropy? The answer is that we don't know. Uh, the entropy seems to be particularly nice. And this has something to do with this physics explanation that we have given. But as we will explain from here, from uh, when we talk about mirror gradient flows, there's a host of families from which there's, this is only one of them. And we actually don't know if the other members of the families have any nice properties. If you replace entropy by, by, by let's say, Rennie entropy or some other opt by some other regularizers, you can come up with lots of them. We just don't know if they're if they're good enough. So th this is just uh, at the edge of research area right now.